Donc Michael Lamar est le fondateur de Crypto Monday. C'est quoi ton email On ne va pas en faire la présentation, mais c'est quoi ton email euh, Michaelamar.gmail.com D'accord. Voilà, donc si vous êtes intéressé par Crypto Monday, c'est michaelamar.gmail.com Non, on va pas faire de publicité. Mais euh, donc je vous laisse. Euh, si Karim, bah c'est toi Michael qui va... Ok, uh, thanks Arthur, Bebop, very, very glad to have you here. Um, perhaps we can just start with a quick presentation. Uh, Arthur? Uh, sure. So uh, my name is Arthur Breitman. Uh, I've been involved for a few years with a project called Tezos. And uh, Tezos is a, uh, it's a cryptocurrency in the same vein as uh, Bitcoin or Ethereum. Uh, it's supposed to launch uh, fairly shortly. Uh, and it's also a smart contract platform. Uh, And uh, prior to that, I've been working mostly in, uh, in finance, in market making, and a bit in uh, robotics. I'm originally from France, but I lived uh, since 2005 in the United States until coming back to France last September. And Arthur is a bit uh, um, low profile here, but uh, they've, uh, they've raised $400 million as one of the most uh, you know, popular. Uh, no, no, I, no? No, that's not. That's not the right number. No, it's not the right number. I, I didn't raise any money. So, uh, so I, I conceived this project called Tezos uh, around like 2014, and there's a Swiss foundation who did a, uh, a fundraiser around 2017, and they raised around that project uh, about 200 million dollars. Okay. But I, 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 you know, it's not modesty. You know, a number like this, it's not a, uh, it's not an achievement. It's a liability. Yeah. I hear you. Bebop, for those who were not here earlier. Um, I'm Bebop Gresta. I'm the chairman and co-founder of Hyperloop Transportation Technologies. It's a new transportation system, the fifth mode of transportation. And we are using an innovative approach in terms of um, your future. We think that um, we have a better way to travel in the future. There should be frictionless. There should be... Uh, human-centric, personalized, and we're using blockchain to actually achieve this in a large scale, in an ecosystem that involves not only the Hyperloop, but an entire value chain of transportation. Thank you very much. So let's talk about um, Bebop, ICO. There is a rumor, there are rumors. Um, but, but blockchain first, okay? So I'll make okay, you more, you know, you'll be more relaxed when I, I'll ask thanks. a question about this. So how, how do you, Hyperloop and yourself, um, see the blockchain impacting what you guys do? And just for the record, I met Bebop um, almost one year ago in an Uber ride, and I didn't know anything about blockchain. And the next day, I spent eight hours per day uh, learning about the blockchain just because of this guy. <laughs> so my, my wife thanks you a lot. I'm not sleeping much these days. <laughs> I, uh, she will hate me, probably. But uh, I think we were uh, casually in this uh, taxi that was with Brock Pierce. Uh, someone loves him, someone hates him, but it's the, the person that actually knows more about uh, this sector that I know. And uh, we were talking about how blockchain will reshape the future of humanity. And I was incredibly humbled to know that now this man became a, a, an authority on that and then super, super good. But I think every one of you should look at this technology. The impact of blockchain in our life will be disruptive. It seems like when we were, we were talking in 95 about the internet, everybody was looking I was in a conference saying how many of you knows uh, what the internet is and 10 hands <laughs> raised the hand I said it will be in everybody's life and they were silent looking at me like what are you talking about blockchain will have the same disruption I think the possibility for humanity to have a system that can really democratize is a, a, a abuse term but let's say reshape the way we interact to each other with a system that actually allow us to get back in control of the, our main um, things, like uh, the economy, industry, um, the, um, everything we know would be touched by blockchain. It's a too of a big of an opportunity to actually be missed. And, um, We are now talking in this room, but there are people inside the top companies in the world. And starting from the financial companies, they are now 
have a project in blockchain. So I'm not talking about uh, the major freight industry, they mean trains, uh, airplanes, everybody is analyzing this. Now, it's a matter of when, and it's a matter of how. We hope, uh, uh, in our side, that this uh, transition will happen um, in a way that uh, um, respects the fundamentals of this. And you don't have to confuse it with the, all the other topics about what you can build on blockchain. So the, the ICOs, the cryptocurrencies, this will go, this will come, it will be act. But the underlying technology is very solid. It can be act, hasn't been act until now. If they act blockchain, actually we have a bigger problem. They, they, our entire society will end. So <laughs> we will have to really think about you know, the, the, the rest of the society first. So that's how we see blockchain and that's what we are working on uh, in terms of Hyperloop. Thank you very much, um, Bebop. Um, <coughs> uh, I'd like to talk a little bit more about uh, Tezos. I think we are in a room where some people actually do not know what Tezos is and uh, what you set out to do a few years ago. Um, could you please, before that, because Tezos is, above all things, a, a platform that allows you to develop smart contracts. Um, Arthur, could you please explain to everybody here what's a smart contract and, most importantly, why they're disruptive? Where, where's the innovation in this matter? Yeah, so, uh, smart contracts were named by uh, computer scientist uh, Nick Szabo a few decades ago, uh, and, and they've been made popular, uh, especially with the rise of Ethereum and cryptocurrency. The idea of a smart contract is that it's a bit of, it's, it's a little bit of code, it's a little bit of computer code that lives uh, on a blockchain and that can automatically enforce some rules for payments. So there's a lot of lawyers who will look at this and say, that's not a contract, you know, they're just playing semantics. But if you're really looking at what it does, uh, another word for it would be automated escrow. So in some sense, you're gonna put money in some accounts that's not really controlled by anyone and that money is going to be unlocked and go towards one person or another person or in different amounts based on external factors that can be received. So it could be something like, you know, if the weatherman signs a report saying that the weather was above a certain amount and the, uh, the contract will look at this report, he will verify that it's authentic and then you know, it will pay out some sort of insurance. And so the main benefit of that is essentially lowering the ticket price for a lot of financial contracts, uh, be it, you know, micro insurance uh, or uh, issuance of uh, equity, all of the, you know, there, there's many different functions which can be where a, a lot of uh, compliance functions or a lot of uh, functions which normally would have to go through lawyers and arbitration uh, can be automated. So that can either, you know, depending on what you're doing, it can easily replace um, the need for, uh, for lawyers or it can automate um, uh, out a lot, of, a lot of potential disputes. Yeah, and it is not only about transactions. You have to specify that, you know, that we can have services attached to the smart contracts or, you know, the, the, uh, for example, in our case, we will have the identity attached to a smart contract and from, through that, uh, we will provide a series of services. The beauty of smart contract is, is dynamic. It can interact and can actually um, be the base for a, for a number of services. Yeah, very clear. Thank you very much. Um, we, we are today before um, a lot of uh, people from big companies, uh, corporate clients, uh, corporate um, uh, firms, big big firms. Um, could, you, could, you, could, you, could you guys maybe tell us a little bit about how do, does any, every company have an interest in working with blockchain and how do you kind of uh, ass assess your needs and, uh, and work that, that, that into your existing value chain? So I can start with transportation. Well, I wish <laughs> every company. So l let me give you an example that is very clear. Okay, why they are not tracking uh, freight? Uh, a lot of the companies are not tracking freight uh, around the world, okay? <laughs> we have the technology, it's not necessarily blockchain. Well, because sometimes the freight enter in a port 
goes through a, a dogen and uh, something else comes out. So maybe some pieces of this uh, is left, especially in some countries, um, they are not doing uh, their work in a legal way, right? So by tracking it, they introduce a problem. Because now if you track it, you see immediately that uh, maybe out of 100 of uh, freight transported, uh, 60 has been left in the port, right? So humanity has technologies, but then there is the application that we need to see. In, the in theory, every single aspect of humans could be benefiting from this technology. All right, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for, for staying with us. Uh, today, uh, sorry for the, the little mishap. Uh, so b before before the, the the break, we've seen uh, with uh, Arthur and uh, Bebop um, how disruptive smart contracts are and uh, where the innovation really is. Uh, we had we've had their views on on blockchain for uh, large firms and large uh, corporate firms. Um, so. Basically, we've seen a bit that blockchain and smart contracts help provide uh, new models of incentives. So, Bebop, you, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, I think you're working with uh, hundreds of PhDs around the world, and you have a, a specific incentive system for them. Could you maybe tell us a little bit about that and how that works? Yeah, uh, the concept was invented by co my co-founder in 2013. Uh, now it's called crowdfunding, uh, crowd uh, sourcing. Sorry, crowdsourcing. Um, even if it doesn't give justice to the, the model, it's a simple concept. You, instead of raising money and then spending it into buying assets or resources, you just go to the people or the partner that actually can contribute and ask them to work in exchange of stock options. And you don't need necessarily to hire them because, you know, if you look at these top engineers, you know, you want a, a scientist from NASA. If you hire him out of NASA, you lose 70% of the reason why you're hiring. <laughs> and this happens all over the time when you actually especially are uh, working with talents uh, at a certain level. Especially when humanity needs to solve a problem so big, like transportation, energy, food, housing. You don't want to reinvent the wheel every single time. How can you possibly build an hyperloop uh, trying to reinvent the pumping uh, industry, the civil industry, the magnetic levitation, the every single aspect? There are companies out there that solve the problem already. To maintain life inside an hyperbaric chamber, there's someone that solved it in the last century. It's called airplane. <laughs> it works. <laughs> we send people in space. It's even easier in the hyperloop because we don't have all the problems and the breaking points and all the problems. So the concept is why don't we imagine a different future for humanity where knowledge is shared and we can create something that creates value and not necessarily in a closer gate, I, I give you the last example in fashion, for example. Yeah? Fashion is a copy industry. You can't patent a dress, right? <laughs> but anyway, even if they copy each other every year, and you create innovation. You create an amazing wave of, of, uh, um, of, of industry, and you create value. In this particular case, you, you imagine a different humanity, a humanity that can work in a competition uh, environment, where the mass mind are shared and can contribute to humanity instead of destroying each other or replicating the same thing. Like, for example, in the scientific uh, environment, uh, all this thing about publication puts uh, teams working on the same thing, doing the same research, using the same machine without adding anything, right? So why don't we use these minds in a better way? And we are the biggest and the more um, exposed example that this is possible because we created an industry that now is worth more than a billion dollars and everything inside the company is shared among the people that are working. I think it's a, an amazing future, and blockchain can actually be the solution to actually complete the cycle. 
Yeah, th th thank you very much. Um, Arthur, you, 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 you kind of have the same issue with your blockchain. So basically, you, you developed a blockchain that people are going to use, and they're not like, they're not your employees, they are people. And so basically, how do you incentivize people to, to work on this new platform that you created? And uh, does this raise, um, and, and you can, you can um, uh, participate to this question too, uh, does this raise governance issues? How do you solve that on, on the Tezos platform? So, I think that you know, in, in any open source project, there's always a very large community of uh, people who are extremely passionate about uh, contributing to these projects, and uh, especially uh, these open blockchains are more, um, they, are, they tend to be ide uh, ideological projects, and they attract people for the, uh, for the ideology and for the mission, and so you'll have a lot of people who want uh, to, uh, to contribute, and that's great. The difficulty is how do you handle uh, people who want to contribute in different ways? And traditionally in the open source world, uh, this has led to what is called fork governance. And the idea of fork governance is that let's say there's a project like an open source web browser and there's different teams of programmers and one of them want to do a browser a certain way and the other one want to do it another way. Uh, the, typically what they'll do is they'll just, you'll just have two versions and then people will end up using one version more than the other and it, yeah, at the end of the day most programmers will be attracted to the, the version that has the most users, that is uh, most, mo most well known and that's how you do governance and that works fairly well. Uh, and with Bitcoin uh, coming from the open source world, I think most people envision the same type of governance, which is fork governance, right? And so if you have different contributors and they have different visions on how to do things, well, that's easy. You fork it. And it doesn't work as well for cryptocurrencies. Could you, I'm sorry to cut. Could you please remind for the people here what's, what's a, a fork? On the, on the blockchain? A fork? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, the idea of a fork, let's say you have a piece of code and it works a certain way. And when the computers that run Bitcoin, they're all running the same piece of code, right? They run exactly the same logic. And if, if some of them decide to run a slightly different logic, to change the code, to make it work differently, then all of a sudden, um, what used to be one cryptocurrency is going to fork into two cryptocurrencies. There'll be you know, uh, a version that runs a certain way and a version that runs another way. Uh, in the same way that in the open source world, if you had a web browser and different people modify it, you know, you used to have one version and now you have two different versions. So a fork in cryptocurrencies is like you had, say, one Bitcoin and there's a fork and now you have one Bitcoin version A and one Bitcoin version B. Uh, and one of the theses behind Tezos is that this, this fork governance works really well for open source projects. They, it does not work as well for... Uh, crypto assets and cryptocurrencies because it can threaten the network effect, which is paramount in those systems. Th yeah. Thank you very much. Um, uh, maybe we can we could dive a little bit more into uh, Tezos governance model. Uh, I think that you've um, you've used you've had inspiration inspirations in like uh, the the Venetian Empire and uh, several economists and and stuff like this. And and I think that's something that we we don't see in a lot of blockchain projects. C could you maybe tell us a little bit more about your, your interest in this kind of thing and, and how that brought value to the Tezos um, platform? Right, so I, I think the main insight is, is to think of, of these blockchains as political systems as opposed to purely computer science. And, and it harks back to a meme that was very prevalent in around 2013, 2014 which was Bitcoin is backed by mathematics. This is all mathematics. It's a pure platonic abstraction. You could just like the, uh, the rule of mass. Uh, even though these are human systems and, and, and the decisions against, around those forks and the different groups at play having influence on, on how these products evolve, this is very much a human uh, system and a political system. And I don't, I, I don't like political system. I would prefer that things operate according to rules of mathematics, but it's not an option that's afforded to us. There is a human element, you can't just wish it away. And uh, so the approach is to try to say, well, let's, let's acknowledge that it's here, but provide formal rules from governance uh, in the same way that you might have formal rule of law uh, in order to, uh, to canalize it uh, and channel it in, 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 in productive directions. 
I think we are at the dawn of a very interesting social experiment. Uh, what happens now, for example, with EOS, you know, that's very similar. It's, it will be a very interesting moment for humanity because we are actually experimenting a new way, a new, a new concept of humanity that is something different. I'm not saying it's better or worse, we'll see <laughs> what but as an amazing promise that is actually disintermediate all this layer of complexity. And sometimes complexity is there for the reason to be complex. So even in politics now, we, for some legacies, we created layers to, in order not to this direct correspondence between the will of the people and what is representing to actually happen. So they put layers because people like, sometimes are dangerous. Not necessarily right or wrong, I'm saying what is there right now, right? So I think these new uh, experiments, because these are experiments that are not yet uh, touching, you're touching 1% of humanity probably, so it's not significant yet, but it's going and it's showing a very interesting representation of what it can be humanity in the future that is based on different principles, maybe as more equal and more um, access to information, to services, disintermediation, privacy, uh, the capability of give and come and take back the permission to do or not to do things. Uh, I think it's amazing and we need to give this humanity a chance to, to start. I, in, in my company, I always talk about the new renaissance that is happening because finally engineering and art are coming back together, like Leonardo da Vinci, I love that. My scientist looks more like a rock star than... <laughs> and this is beautiful because it means that we can attract a new generation of kids that can be inspired not to be necessarily a rock star or a, an engineer. So, fun, boring. <laughs> it's, Science is fun, it's amazing. It's, you can bring this freaking Tesla in the space and launch it versus Mars. You can do things now that are incredible and humanity has the technology to do that. But these are enabler and this is the expression of what we can do. So my message is we don't dismiss uh, this kind of uh, experiment or um, as, as a coin or as a speculation or the ICO part. Because that's the less interesting part. It will constantly be up and down, up and down. It's, it follows the media, cir the, the media circus, right? Now, everybody, uh, Bitcoin. Now, Bitcoin is evil. Uh, now, Bitcoin, it was good. <laughs> we will have the sequel of Bitcoin was good in, in summer. Summer, everybody will start to talk about Bitcoin again, okay? So, prepare your wallet. Whoever has somebody left from the first wave, invest again. It would be awesome. But that's <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. 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 So, uh, author, do you, do you see that also as a uh, social experiment, experiment of um, decentralized trust? And um, what, what, what was your, your view when, when you started to get into this uh, ecosystem? Yeah, I, I think it's, uh, it's really interesting and it's really unique. If you look at... Uh, the value prop of Bitcoin, for example, one way to look at it is to say, well, for the entire history of humanity, whenever you wanted to pay someone, you, you, know, you could give them some money directly, but if they, were, if they live at a distance, the only way to do this was through trusted intermediaries, was through uh, some sort of banking system. And that's the way it's been for the past you know, 100,000 years, of, I, or, or the entire history of humanity, until a few years ago where for the first time it was, po it was possible to hand a, like what is essentially a bearer asset to another person without a trusted intermediary. And that, that, is, that, is ex that is extremely new, that's unique. It's not clear what the consequences are. Maybe, you know, maybe it's a bad idea. Maybe bearer assets are a bad idea to begin with, but I, I, I don't think so. But it's, it's very new and, and, and to expect that to expect that there's going to be very fast adoption or that somehow the system should come out and, and, and be perfect. I think it's short-sighted. Uh, people are looking at Bitcoin and saying, oh, you know, it can only do tr four transactions per second. Oh, look, there's, it, it's volatile. It's not, it, it's not being used. This is extremely, extremely short-sighted. You have to take a 20-year view on these things. 
Thank you. Uh, I'll give you the, 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 the mic uh, in a second, but I, I was interested to, to know more about how you got from... Uh, so you were a TV personality uh, in Italy and in Europe, and so basically I, I've read that uh, as a kid you loved uh, science and, uh, and music or entertainment. In so basically my question is, how, how did you go from uh, entertainment to uh, tech, to Hyperloop, and uh, ultimately to blockchain ICOs and this uh, ecosystem? Because that's not very common. I, I love this question because usually they use it to discriminate. You know, oh, you were a TV personality. So I was a programmer first. I was a programmer from nine to 20. I was head of business of uh, uh, software engineering when I was 15. That's just to clarify something. Then, yes, I did a record. It went uh, number one in the chart. Then I had an MTV show. Fine. But, you know, I, my background is technical. Okay. Then I created an incubator uh, because during 95, doing shows in TV and talking about uh, informatics, uh, you know, internet, it was really crazy, okay? So Telecom Italia asked me to do a consultancy and I invented Alice, Alice. Most of you have used it probably in the internet. Well, that was a super successful project that went from Italy to Spain to France and so on. So I created a lot of value for them. And they decided to buy my company for, a, outrageous amount of money when I was 28. Now, don't give an outrageous amount of money to a 28 years old. This is stupid, but they did it. But anyway, I created also something very good. There was an incubator that created 70 companies. Uh, for a period, they said I was 20% of the Italian innovation market. Not because I'm cool, because the Italian innovation market doesn't exist. <laughs> so I don't want to claim something. But the reality of the fact is strictly connected. I think, you know, right now the new heroes of this uh, period, luckily enough, are not the hero that we've had. Like I was idolatrating very bad people like Michael Jackson. I mean, he's not a bad person, but yeah, there's, there's some psychological problem, right? Uh, Rolling Stones, uh, you know, freaking stoners, right? These kids, the new kids, I have as a point of reference Steve Jobs, um, you know, the, the Mark Zuckerberg, and, and people that, like us are actually changing humanity, doing some, trying to do something uh, meaningful. I think this is good, and this is the swift that humanity is doing, and that's why I say uh, engineering, uh, science is fun. Now you should, if you are an artist, you should think about studying science and, and not uh, embrace some crazy music. It doesn't make any money anymore, so <laughs> better do <All> science. Right. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, we, we have three, three or four minutes left. Um, Maybe Arthur, could, could you tell us a bit like what 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 are gonna be uh, what are gonna the, the the next 12 months look like for uh, Tezos? What are your ambitions? Um, what what are what are your main challenges? Oh boy, that's good. Um, <laughs> we'll see. I mean, what I think is very exciting over the next uh, 12 launch of uh, 12 months of Tezos that after it launches, it's really seeing uh, everything that the Tezos community is going to come up with. There's a lot of people building applications, uh, building projects around Tezos, and uh, seeing those come to fruition. And you know, seeing uh, what I like is, you know, it's like it, it, what we're building is a um, is, is essentially a, a, a base uh, a base layer for people to build applications. So it's kind of like shipping a big box of Lego uh, and seeing what uh, people are going to build with it. So that's super exciting, and uh, that's what I'm looking forward to. Uh, on my own, what, what, what I'm personally interested in is uh, uh, consensus algorithms. So the, the Tezos uses a consensus algorithm in order to, uh, to, to keep one version of the ledger. Uh, that was designed in 2014. There's been a lot of research since then that uh, a little faster consensus, more reliable consensus, higher throughput in terms of transactions. So focusing on that, uh, on that part of research is something I'm, uh, I'm quite interested in. All right, thank you. And uh, Bebop, so uh, we, we've invited you to Crypto Monday because, and I, I think not many people know that, is you're, you're considering, you're thinking of doing an, uh, raising funds with an ICO for the Hyperloop um, project. Could, could you tell us a little bit about where you stand on this project right now? So we're not confirming or <laughs> denying any interest on ICOs. Let's say 
that we are working on two levels. The first level is to actually give a completion to our model that came even before, you know, we born with the crowd uh, sourcing concept. The problem that you have right now is that everyone that took the stocks uh, from the beginning, they have no liquidity, right? So the model will be perfect if somehow these stocks then can be converted in something that they can use every day to pay the bills or, you know, my company is powered by passion and it's amazing. But at the end of the day with passion, you can live every day, you can eat. So yeah, you have retired scientists that doesn't care about this, but they have also students and people who love to actually help them. So we're looking at different options and this one could could be one of them. Of course, has to be, we are a global company. Everything we say goes in 190 countries. And uh, it's uh, with the 15 brand in Facebook, we have a responsibility also uh, to actually bring this company to build the first Hyperloop, to be the safest thing uh, in the planet, and also give humanity a new series of services that can actually uh, be implemented. I think uh, blockchain in general, then we see its uh, derivation that is a possible coin, for example, but that's not the only way, so there could be other ways, so we are not saying yet that we are choosing ICO or a coin, uh, um, but um, the technology behind it is uh, fascinating and it uh, will revolution everything. All right, th thank you very much. So this is the, 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 the end. We, we have two great speakers, so uh, yeah, even if we are, um, uh, overlap a bit on the, on the time, if anybody has a question that they want to ask to, to Bebop or uh, Arthur, and we'll take it. We're good? All right, so thank you very much. Um, <laughs> thank you. <laughs>